What is this? <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at another one of Sabine Hossenfelder's videos. Specifically this one on Betavolt's nuclear battery. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this one out. A Chinese company has announced they're planning to mass produce tiny nuclear batteries that can last up to 50 years, possibly beating both a British and an American company who've tried to put those on the market for several years. What does this mean? Will we soon all power our phones with nuclear that power? That would be cool. Let's have a look. We tend to think of radioactive material primarily as dangerous, and that's for good reasons, but that it's radiating also means that it's emitting energy. Ra that is true. A lot of people do consider radioactive material in general to be, to be considered dangerous, but a lot of it is they really just don't understand what it is. Like bleach is hazardous, but people understand what bleach is, and yet it's not... People aren't afraid of bleach. It's just... A matter of understanding what technology you're using is and that's the main difference. If materials therefore make for great batteries. If you use a material with a long half-life, nuclear batteries could last thousands of years without having to recharge. The idea isn't new, especially for medical devices where battery replacements are a health hazard. Similar-ish technology is used for spacecraft. The Voyager probe uses an RTG or radioisotope thermoelectric generator which converts heat produced from radioactive decay into electricity using thermoelectric materials such as thermocouples in this case. And that heat difference drives a flow of electrons which produces a continuous supply of electricity over time. You don't need any fuel, you don't need any moving parts. These things are useful for things that don't necessarily require a lot of power to use. So once the spacecraft's already in space, you don't need much. But for it to be constant over the course of years, decades, long periods of time. Already in the 1970s, pacemakers were equipped with plutonium-powered batteries. Yep. Some of them still- If you want to see me talk more about nuclear pacemakers, I'll pin it in a comment down below. That's really interesting. You could be a nuclear person. Today, newer devices use lithium batteries that have to be replaced once in a decade or so. But nuclear power is currently enjoying a strong comeback as an environmentally friendly source of energy. A few companies are producing nuclear batteries powered by tritium decay, but at the moment they're used primarily for scientific or medical purposes rather than for the consumer market. It's because... And that's just it. For scientific purposes, since scientists are more comfortable knowing the risks and benefits of nuclear power than the general consumer electronics market. Hopefully that'll change. Produce very little power in the range of nanowatts or microwatts. Just for comparison, your phone needs a few watts at least. So these batteries are not replacements for the batteries that you're used to. They're good to deliver low power, but for a very long time. Yes, that's true. I talked about this in a short I made a while ago, and I misspoke. I was wrong in saying that 100 microwatts was enough to power your phone. It's, it's not. That doesn't mean it doesn't have uses, but I got ahead of myself and I was talking about the, the 1 watt version, which could conceivably charge your phone on the order of several hours. A lot of phone batteries, 10 to 15 watt hours in them, so it would, it would take a while for it to charge your phone, but it'll, it'll keep going, which is, which is nice. But that technology hasn't been developed yet. There's a market for this, but it's a small one. In the past years, we have repeatedly seen headlines about startups who want to bring more and bigger nuclear batteries on the market. Notably, mm. that's the British company Arkenlight, formed by researchers at the University of Bristol. They said they wanted to bring small nuclear batteries on the market by 2024 using carbon-14 in the range of up to 200 microwatts. That's interesting, carbon-14, the same one that's used for carbon dating. I guess that makes sense with its long half-life of over 5,000 years. One thing a lot of people don't realize about carbon dating is it has kind of a limited range. Anything over, say, 50,000 years, that's 10 half-lives, which most people in radiation protection say that substance is 
basically gone when you're at the 7 to 10 half-life range. That's not to say you can't date anything older than 50,000 years. They're going to need to use something with a half-life that's longer than carbon-14. Natural uranium, for instance, has a half-life closer to 5 billion years. It's on the high end of nuclear batteries, but still very little compared to what most devices need. Mm. Their website seems to have gone missing last year. <laughs> then there's the American company Nano Diamond Batteries that made a lot of headlines a few years ago by claiming they can produce batteries that last more than 20,000 years from nuclear waste. A few months ago, charges of from nuclear waste, that, that's a bit of a misnomer. You don't really consider it to be waste. And after all, if you're reusing it, it's an interesting idea, but no. Fraud were raised against them. The claim is that the company deceived investors by pretending Ooh, to SEC have tested trouble. technology that didn't exist. So the half-life of that company was somewhat shorter than expected. That's pretty good. <laughs> Half-life of a company, I'll, I'll, I like that. Just exactly what technology are these companies working on? Batteries powered by nuclear decay come in two different types. The one is to use a radioactive substance to generate heat and then use the difference in temperature between two places to generate okay. a current. Just like this I talked about earlier. This is known as a radioisotope yep. thermoelectric generator. For space probe. The technology for this was first developed in the 1950s and 60s by the Air Forces in the United States and the former former Soviet Union. But it can also be placed in remote areas that you don't want to get to, like out in the middle of the Arctic that you don't have to go periodically change out the batteries for or have to haul a temp diesel out for just a little weather antenna or something like that. So again, the idea, something that doesn't require a lot of power, but you don't want to interact with it. And they were looking for a reliable and long-lasting power source for space missions, particularly those exploring environments where solar power isn't available. At least that's what they said was the reason they were developing these things. Pretty sure they came in handy for other purposes too. Would you like a nuclear battery with your summon? Whatever the motivation to develop what? nuclear <laughs> batteries, they've since been used in many space missions. Also, the European Space Agency has recently given up its... What is this? <laughs> I'm sure it's a silly artist rendition of something, but I don't even know. what Was that runes? Magic runes on the back of that spacecraft? Can't say I've worked with a bit, any bit of nuclear technology that uses magic runes. ...to using nuclear batteries. This is probably in no small part because of what happened with the Philae probe that landed on a comet in 2014 as part of the Rosetta mission. It had a rough touchdown, hopped a few times and landed in the shadow. <laughs> After hopped. three days, its batteries, which were supposed to recharge on solar power, died. Mm. And that was the premature end of a very expensive mission. ESA is now planning to use a new nuclear powered spacecraft for its Argonaut moon lander scheduled to launch in the early 2030s. But while the technology for these radioisotope thermoelectric generators is well understood, they tend to be quite big. Also, the detour... Yeah, compared to, for instance, the ones on the Voyager were on the order of a few hundred watts. You're not going to need that for your phone. <laughs> a temperature gradient is rather inefficient if what you want to do is to generate electricity. If electricity That's is what true. you want, a better solution is to use semiconductors in which the generation of electricity is driven by nuclear decay. The thing about thermoelectric generators, though, is they're created in an area before a lot of small scale electronics. So they existed in 60s, 70s. So you didn't really need the whole miniaturization technology that we have now. That's where things are going to get interesting. A little bit of something old and something new. New battery put forward by the Chinese company is of that type. And so are the ones by the British and American companies. These types of batteries are called alpha voltaic. What is this I'm looking at? I'm, I'm not sure what this is supposed to represent because it's a battery. Not, I guess they're trying to make it some fancy. This looks like some sci-fi magical vault substance or 
something. I don't know. Voltaic or gamma voltaic batteries, depending on whether they use radioactive alpha, beta or gamma decay. Just as a quick reminder, alpha decay means that a large nucleus spits out chunks with two neutrons and protons, which are helium nuclei. Beta decay means the nucleus spits out electrons and gamma decay means that the nucleus spits out photons. It's all different heat sources and the main difference as far as handling these sort of things is the alphas and the betas have very short range but the gammas will continue to pass through just about anything holding that's holding this battery you need depends on the energy level granted energy level of these gammas is going to be low since we're just talking about basic radioactive decay here no magical particle acceleration or or additional heat sources beyond just what's causing decay even still in order to completely stop them you'll need several inches of lead for gammas but the alphas and betas have the advantage in that you don't need as much material so the casing of the the casing of the battery would stop alphas and possibly betas, depending on how thick it is. Chinese company uses better decay and calls itself better vault after that. They use nickel 63, <laughs> which has a is half better. life of roughly 100 <laughs> years and layered between diamond semiconductors with a PN junction. This sounds kind of technical and I guess it is, but maybe it helps to know that this semiconductor stuff is the same type of material that's normally used in solar cells. In the solar cells, it's in falling light that creates a current. For the nuclear battery it's not in falling light but the electrons emitted in the beta decay that create the current the company better vault on third prize for the battery in a recent innovation competition by the china national Only nuclear third place, corporation huh? the technology itself isn't new but the push to the consumer market is the company's first product is called the bv100 battery it has a power of 100 microwatts and a voltage of three a volts. Fun sound it has about the same size as a typical cell battery. The power is somewhat lower than what the British company is aiming at, but the voltage they quote is somewhat higher. So the Chinese battery looks plausible enough, but like the other nuclear batteries, it's probably going to remain a niche technology for low power devices that need to last a long time. So 100 microwatts. So we've eliminated phones, but anything that uses a time clock circuit it, three volts, 100 microwatts, not bad. And they have a, quite a few industrial sensors, switches, a lot of little smart devices that you don't, that, that are a pain to go in and replace. She already talked about pacemakers, medical implants, small communication devices. Talked about space exploration, but the small guy, you, you use the RTG for the actual engine of the probe, but the little sensors and little and gizmos that you need the probe to actually perform its operations can use the small beta volt battery. I don't I don't really know if it's that niche though because there's a lot of so many devices have these little smart sensors and can use these little time clock circuits mainly in now I'm, I'm mainly thinking industrial as far as consumer electronics maybe less so if I though I could be missing something if any of you could who knows more about consumer electronics could leave a comment down below about its viability in that market. I'd be really curious to know, but I can see quite a few smart industrial applications for this technology. So I wouldn't say it's that useless or that niche. But then again, this is just the sort of stuff that I'm used to. It's a shame because if you had a phone battery that lasted 20,000 years, you could watch. And Betavolt said that they would, they were thinking of scaling things up, but you, 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 you just never know. All my videos in one go. Many thanks to our sponsors <laughs> on Patreon. As That's funny. I still like your sense of humor. Thanks again for uh, recommending more of these videos. And thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.